When you're guiding people in your purpose work, how do you define soul? Sure. Uh, well, we touched on one of, it, one of the elements already. Soul is imagination. Uh, Jung used this word, Seelenbild. Uh, uh, it's a composite term meaning soul image. Mm-hmm. I love that. So I, I just want to be clear that I'm going to approach it um, poetically because it's the only way I know how to uh, approach it. From an utter classical non-dual perspective, it smacks of narrative um, in a way that can seem, you know, uh, you know, not um, not particularly true. And from the ego standpoint, it, um, it it doesn't carry much water either. But I think what we're dealing with is something that can't be um, defined or uh, given a concept, but it's a symbol for something. It's a symbol for the place from which deep meaning issues forth um, into our lives. And so there's this great quote from Frederick Buechner. He's a, uh, a theologian, and he says, find God, find that place where your deepest gladness and the world's deep hunger meets. So I'll say that again. Mm-hmm. Find that place where your deepest gladness, your deepest joy, and the world's hunger meets. Mm-hmm. So I would say soul is a purpose beyond self. Mm -hmm. Soul is the place that wants to meet life as an offering, as a gift, as a demonstration of love. And it comes through the imagination. And you can feel it. Like if someone says, oh, that saxophone playing was really soulful tonight. It came from a certain place. Mm -hmm. The the soulful place inside. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Uh, And I would also say soul is place. uh, in, in Bill Plotkin's uh, book, Soulcraft, he says that your soul is like your true nature. Your soul can be thought of as your true place in nature. Mm-hmm. Like you have a sp- specific niche or niche, if you say it that way, in the, the habitat of life. So everything has its ecological niche. Well, why wouldn't a human being, not to mention the entire species, so you don't see a, uh, I don't know, a sunflower saying, I wish I was a rose. And you don't see a rose saying, I wish I was a daffodil. But because of our self-reflective capacity, we can imagine many purposes that are not our own, that are not our own. Mm-hmm. And so I, I, you know, I wish I had the ability to be a, a great jazz musician. I tried with my drumming and so forth. But the world isn't craving uh, for me to, to play jazz drums and, and pay me for it and support me to do it. I also tried to be a ski racer and I enjoyed it, but again, just it wasn't my calling. So the question is, is there a place inside of a person that is their destiny? And I would call that that place soul. Mm-hmm. And I would also say that soul is perception. It's a way, it's a, how did I put it before? A mode of being. Right, so it's this imaginal perceiving um, in which uh, deep meaning actually can sprout. So it, I would say, soul directs us to a kind of an aliveness and a depth and a sacredness um, of our purpose. Can I? I want to yeah. ask you. I want to ask you a little a clarification because I think I like the uh, specifically like the soulless perception and what I'm gathering in 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 between the lines of what we're saying what you're saying is at least in part is that perception is you know when we hear like we hear the word perception or or like okay what am i supposed to perceive and we're looking for something really concrete and solid right definite let's say but it seems that so often what we're, we're soul perception is something that's more intuitive if I, if I understand what you're saying. Oh, abs- absolutely. It's, right. it's nothing we could have thought up ourselves. Right. We literally, there, there are these moments of destiny where we're, we're, we're drawn out of ourselves. And so, uh, so for instance, when I was a kid, uh, I was a Jewish boy in a suburb of Toronto, and I'm watching this TV show called Kung Fu with David Carradine. <laughs> and uh, I liked the Kung Fu scenes. They were, they were great. But that wasn't the real reason I was watching. There are these flashback scenes to an old, I think, Shaolin monastery. And there's the, the master and he would call his student grasshopper. Yeah. And uh, I would just go gaga over this. And I was, you know, I don't know, 9, 10, 11. 
And it was like an image of my destiny, that there was something there. I had no idea, you know, what Zen or Buddhism or anything of, of the sort was. And it was, I literally felt called out of myself. There was, it was a very special um, moment. And so you can have an image. I mean, this is kind of funny than that, you know, my image came through television, but, you know, I was watching a lot of it as the kid in, in the seventies. And so there's, it's that sense of, um, uh, that this is what we were meant for. It's not so much a choice. It's like an aha. Yeah. You're it's got like by it. Something in you suddenly becomes enlivened. Yeah. Right. I was like, oh, I, I, there's a, I wish I could remember it because he's my favorite poet. You'd think I'd remember the name of my favorite poet, but this morning <laughs> it's, he's, he's um, skipping my, my mind. But there was a, there was a phrase he had that he was, that he mentions in a poem. And he was, um, he was told this by his mother when he was, struggling to find his place in the world you know what am i supposed to be doing on my place in the world and um she said um do what the world is trying to become and it was one of those phrases do what the world is trying to become and i think what she was it, it's one of those sort of soul oriented ways of speaking um because it's not what i find when when so often, and I, I mean, I remember feeling this way at an earlier point in my life, you know, and, and certainly a lot of people that come to me and talk to me about life orientation. And they're often looking like, what do, what do I want to do? And which is what we usually reference, right? What do I want to do? And of course, that's, that's included, I think, in finding our sort of soul orientation as, as it relates to our our, our purpose or what we're going to be doing, our, how, what we're going to manifest in our lives. That's part of it. But I think there's something also, and I think you suggested this um, quite strongly without saying it overtly. It's almost like, I think of it as you have to be open to the world finding you. Hmm. So it can find you. And when it finds you, it tells you, like you said, when you were watching the TV program, you know, and you'd see this, these scenes of this kid in a monastery, the Shaolin monastery, but it's a TV program and something about you just sort of turned on, right? You didn't know why you were turned on at that moment, but it was sort of, I think of it, it's sort of like, almost like a, a phrase they use in literature, a foretelling, hmm. sort of a, a peak forward. Of course, you don't know that it's a peak forward until you've lived forward in your life 20 or 30 years. And then you can see, oh, that was a peak forward. But I do think these ha things happen in all of our lives. Um, and I think often we are very much encouraged to not give them a lot of much weight. Yeah. Because as you say, they are, are imaginal. They can sometimes seem somewhat impractical. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're often, um, oriented, um, sort of in whatever the, the conditioning of our culture, how they define a good life. It, it's interesting though. when uh, so often in so many cultures, certainly in the West, it's this way often when we are doing what our culture has sort of defined for us or our family of origin or something defined, like this is a successful life that you do that and so many people find find out that it doesn't actually feel like a successful life yeah it doesn't yeah. feel enriching and enlivening and full and an expression of something that's really deep inside of them rather than defined by the world around them mm -hmm. you know, or the, the 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 ideas that came from the people in the world around them um, when our, yeah i was just going to say when when our guiding light is what we think we know <laughs> is going to be best for us when we follow that too closely and cleave yeah. too closely to it um i think we diminish uh, our lives i mean a, a, as an example i had a, an image of the way uh, my life partner would be um and then i met my actual wife and relative to the image that I had created, she was relatively more conventional, let's say, than what I thought I was looking for. And I fell head over heels in love with her. And we have, to my mind, a, a really great marriage. Mm -hmm. So it, rather than letting my ego sort of type up my demands or even my preferences, and again, I, I don't think it's wrong to know what your preferences are, right? and to be able to hold that lightly and then see 
what is really going to bring you, you know, out of yourself into something that is just beautiful. So when you said do what the world wants to become, it's also like do what life is calling you to. Mm -hmm. And at this pivotal time, this century, I think is, you know, going to be a little on the make or break side uh, for a number of reasons. We we're not living 2000 years ago or even a hundred years ago. We're living now. And I think there's a kind of an activist bent in many of us that feels like we want to be of some use uh, during this time. And enlightenment would certainly help. And what would also help is being an emotional adult. But there's this third thing, which is on the, this fourth turning, if you will, where do we place our hands on the rope? What is our place for impact, for loving the world? And that's, what, that's, that's listening to what the world wants you to become.